I am, um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, it has been a minute. See, I'm already tangled. It's on my heel. I'm just going to do this. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, it has been a minute. Um, there are a lot of familiar faces that I see. Um, there are some new faces, and I'm excited. Thank you for having me, and um, I, it's going to be fun. I might be taking my shoes off in a minute. Um, so, <laughs> But, you know, I, I'll be honest, um, it was kind of a little nerve-wracking. Um, I, I do a lot of different um, speaking engagements. I speak at our church. Um, I've been in different places. But when um, Sister McGee asked me to speak, and I was like, you know, I'm going to have to pray about that one. <laughs> because sometimes, how many know that when you kind of come back home, it's a little nerve-wracking? <laughs> because um, many of you probably know that I wasn't always the angel child and so um, being in ministry was probably not my choice. Um, how many know sometimes the Lord has a different plan than what we have, right? So um, never say never. Um, I always said I would never marry a preacher, and that is exactly what happened. Um, and then I told my husband, I said, I will never speak on the stage. Um, I'll sing some backup on the stage or whatever, um, but I'm never going to speak. Um, never say never, um, and so here we are, right? But um, I'm excited. God's done a lot um, in our life and in our ministry. Um, I'm probably going to share um, some different things with you. I'm a pretty transparent person, so if that bothers you, I'm sorry. Um, I'm pretty transparent with just what God has done in my life. Um, I'm blessed, and I'm thankful for the many lessons that I've learned along the way, um, and I like to share them. So um, but just a little bit, um, um, Sister McGee kind of said a little bit about who I am, but of course I had to bring pictures. Um, I like pictures. I'm always taking photos somewhere. So um, I think they have a picture of our family, and so this is um, our group that is here. Um, our oldest is Mariah. She is over on the side holding the baby. She's now 25. She's actually working on her um, PhD in child psychology, like holy moly, um, and this is her husband who just passed um, his, the bar. Uh, he just completed law school and passed the bar last week. So we're like, yes, woohoo, he's been so stressed out. And then, of course, my wonderful new little grandbaby, um, Micah. He is our first true redhead of our family. He is bright redhead. And he is starting to show true colors of a redhead. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm like, go mom and dad. <laughs> so, and then we have uh, my awesome, he is my firstborn, Makai. Um, he is um, loud and proud and all the things, and um, he's actually currently our student pastor. Um, I probably will have a few things to kind of talk about him, but God has moved in his life. So proud of him, um, and he loves the gym. Um, he loves to work out. He is in the gym all of the time, but he has a passion even to reach out to those, and he really speaks Jesus even when he's in the gym, and so I'm really proud of that. I have Maddox. He's our 16-year-old. He's kind of more of our quiet one. Um, I kind of giggle, but he is our quirky one. Um, he always has something very interesting to say, and it's very dry. Um, a little example, we have, we're at football practice, and, and this kid comes up, and he, I don't know what he was doing. He's like eight, you know, and he's like, coach, whatever, to Chad. And Maddox just looks over, and he looks up at us, and he goes, there is not a thought behind his eyes. <laughs> like, just real dry. And I was like, Maddox. I'm like, you can't say that about somebody else's kid. I'm like, you need to go over there and sit down. So that's Maddox. <laughs> so, and then we have Malik. We call him the bonus. Um, a little bit of a surprise, but he's our bonus. Um, and so he does not have the word humble in his um, dictionary vocabulary at all. He's good at everything, and he'll tell you about it. And then he wants everyone else to know about it as well. So he's very athletic. Um, but he is the one that I took the leap, and we are homeschooling. And so um, this is our second year. So my philosophy is I'm like one year at a time. <laughs> so here we are with uh, year number two. But this is our family. I think they have a couple other pictures. This was us, and this is like the church picture. But this is us typically. We're pretty kind of goofy. We like more of the fun pictures, and there's probably another one. But um, we love all things fun, and we're a very loud house, which I love. Um, and I'm a gamer. So anytime we're together, I'm like, let's play a game. And they're like, oh my goodness. But um, So that's our crew. So I'm very proud of them. But so as I get ready to kind of speak tonight, um, I know Sister McGee had told me um, the theme was, I speak Jesus. And as I began to kind of pray about it, there were different things that kind of kept coming to mind. And of course, I was asking her, and I'm like, you know, do you have a direction that you want me to go? And of course, she was like, you know, whatever the Lord lays on your heart. And I'm like, okay. 
And I'll be honest, as I kind of got going, um, my message for Saturday, I, I was like, uh, Lord, are you like sure about this? So come Saturday and you'll find out what it is, but I'm kind of excited about it. Um, but tonight, I really felt like there had to be a little bit of some groundwork that had to be laid a little bit before we kind of jumped into some stuff. So I want you just to kind of kind of go with me a little bit on this journey as we get, as we get going and, and we're going to tie it all in. But can we just kind of pray before we get going? Whether you want to or not, I'm going to. So I'm going to pray. All right. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this opportunity. And Lord, I know the things that you have spoke on my heart, but Lord, I pray that you completely remove me. God, I pray that I am your hands, your feet, your words tonight. Lord, you know every single lady that is in this room, you know things that they are walking through, you know things that they even carried in here. And Lord, I just pray that you just meet them exactly where they are. I pray that every word that I say, God, would be clear and God, that you would open our ears and hearts to what you have, and we thank you in Jesus' name. We all said, amen. amen. I have a quote I want to read to you. It's from Dr. Dr. Tony Evans, and it says this. It says, your greatest enemy is not in your home. Your greatest enemy is not on your job. Your greatest enemy is not that person at church who gets under your last nerve. Your greatest enemy is in your very own mouth. It's a three-inch muscle that has more power to destroy your life than anything or anyone else ever. Proverbs 18, 20 through 21 says, life and death are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. So we know our theme this week is I speak Jesus and as I got to study in this message a little bit, I just, I couldn't get my mind off this word speak. I speak Jesus. And I wonder if we truly understand just how important our words and our speech truly, truly is. And if we think about it, we know that the Bible has several, several verses that talk about our tongue and our words. I think it's important the Lord is trying to teach us something when we're seeing so many scriptures on this, right? But we have to understand that our speech and the things that we choose to say, they have the power of life and they have the power of of death. You see, this tool behind our teeth, our, our little, this little tongue, it can influence your world for good or it can influence your world for bad. It's up to you. How many of you remember maybe um, as a kid and your mom would like look over at you and give you like the mom eyes and she'd be like, girl, watch your mouth. And you're like, you know, girl, watch your mouth. Everybody look at your neighbor and say, girl, watch your mouth. But this time you have to put sass in it and say, girl, watch your mouth. All right. I remember I'd be looking, and she'd say, girl, watch your mouth. And sometimes it it would be followed by a, (sighs) or a big eye roll, right? Okay, girl, watch your mouth. But man, if we were ever truly to understand the lesson learned behind watching our mouth. You see, it's important that we learn how powerful our words are. Do you realize that when God created, he used words When the enemy wants to come in and destroy and deceive, he uses words. Like words are powerful, and it's up to us to use them for good or bad. Proverbs 13.3 says this. It says, those who control their tongue will have a long life. Opening your mouth can ruin everything. Be alert, because whatever controls your mouth controls your life. I want to share a little story with you. Chad and I, um, we love to travel. One day, our children might move out. I don't know. We were kind of laughing because we were talking the other day, and I'm soon getting ready to have another daughter-in-law. Well, not soon, but a daughter, a fiancé? I don't know how that works. It's soon coming. (laughs) And so we were kind of giggling because we were kind of looking at other houses or whatever, and Makai, my 20-year-old of all things, and he was like, oh, look, there's a shop on this one. I can just move in there, and I can fix it up. And I'm like, what? I'm like, I never had plans for you to move into the backyard. So, (laughs) but we like to travel. And so um, when Chad and I get the chance to kind of get away, we like to travel. One of our favorite places, we love going to Colorado, anywhere in the mountains. We just love it. And there's a place that we used to go to. um, It was a little cabin. 
And it would take like an hour for us to get up to where this cabin was. So we would drive up there, and we loved getting up there. How many of you have just kind of taken a drive up through the mountains? Anybody just kind of take a drive? I mean, it's just peaceful. It's beautiful. And as we would drive up there, like the trees are just lush. And I love whenever you would drive up, you see like the, the cascading water, and it's like going down the big rocks, you know. And sometimes we're like peeking out to see if we ever see like a mountain goat or, you know, like, ooh, can you see a bear? You know, like we're always just kind of looking. And I remember as we got ready one year, we were going up to this cabin. We hadn't been there yet. And we're trying to find where it is. And all of a sudden, we came to a clearing. And it literally was like green, wonderful, beautiful pine trees. And then we came to a clearing. And it was like brown. And they're all on the ground. And it just was getting worse and worse. And it's like all cleared out and just yuck, you know. And we were like, man, this is, this is, this is crazy. Like, this is really ugly. And later on in that week, we realized that that was the remains of what is known as the Haman Forest Fire. This has been years ago. And we kind of, I was kind of like studying. I kind of wanted to look up exactly what had happened. And there was a park ranger, of all things, there was a park ranger who had been kind of going through a divorce. And she had letters from her ex-husband. And she was just an emotional wreck, whatever. And she lit the letters on fire. And the bad thing was, is that they had red flags out for a red no-burn zone. She's in a lot of trouble. <laughs> so I, I think she's actually even maybe in jail still. I'm not really sure. Um, but this fire, what's crazy is you have this itty-bitty little spark, right? This itty-bitty spark, this one match that she decided to light. And that thing caught, and it burned over 138,000 acres in that forest from one match, just a spark, right? And you see, I think sometimes we don't understand the damage that something so small can have. And something that has taken years to like produce vegetation and it's beautiful and all these things are growing, like within moments it's gone. But it can take years upon years, sometimes decades for anything to grow back and for life to come back into it. Our words have power just like that. One spark. One word. In James chapter 3, 3 through 6, it says this, We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth, and a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but the tiny spark can set a great forest fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness. I really felt it was important before we could truly speak the name of Jesus, we had to fully understand how important this word speak is. And tonight, there's three different kinds of speech, or maybe I'm going to say words, that I want to talk to you about. And the very first one is their words. T-H-E-I-R, their words. Maybe you are where you are today because somebody spoke life into you. Somebody gave you hope they were able to kind of help edge you along into achieving those dreams and going to school. Maybe you are sitting there because their words were life to you. But maybe you're sitting here today and you're thinking, hmm, their words are what caused you. They caused you to lose hope. Their words are what came in and they destroyed dreams that you once had. It was their words that destroyed expectations. Maybe their words came to you when you were a child. Maybe their words came yesterday. Maybe their words came from a parent. Maybe it was a close friend. Maybe their words was a spouse. No matter where or whoever these words came from, these words last, uh, uh, sorry, I just told that, uh, these words, um,
I'm good, my notes are here. But I can feel such a pushback in here. (laughs) Father, I speak right now in this room, and I'm speaking Jesus in this room. And I know you have given me words to speak. I am just a vessel. I am just a servant. So, Lord, I pray that you would begin to walk through this room. Your presence is already here. Use me. Enemy, you have no authority in this room. In Jesus' name, get out. Those words affected you. And you see, the sad thing about their words is that we have a tendency to take those words and we either, one, want to prove them wrong and we work so hard to prove them wrong or we take their words and we carry them and we personalize them and they become our identity. And we live this life trapped And you see, the problem with this is that when we allow their words to hold on to us the way that we allow it, it allows the enemy to come in, and then God can't do what he's wanting to do in your life because the enemy now has a foothold. You see, their words are the ones that stop us from what God is wanting in your life. Now, I do understand that a lot of times their words, we're not responsible for their words but we are responsible for the way we respond to their words. You see, I allowed for a long time, I allowed fear, I allowed bitterness, I allowed um, just hatred to overwhelm me because of people, because of things that people would say, because the things that people, um, they assumed, it hurt, it broke my heart. And I remember, I, God really had to open my eyes and say, listen, like, I, I would walk around just feeling sorry for myself. I sometimes would feel entitled to the way that I felt, right? Like, how dare they do that? I'm entitled to feel this way. No, I can't. I've got to begin to release what they spoke over me. I cannot hold on to what they said about me. Listen to me, the enemy will use people and will use circumstances in any way to to trap us in our lives and listen to divert our attention to what God has called us to. People and circumstances, do you hear me? And if we let the if we let this God listen if you allow these words God has something for you in this room but I just know I know from example for me God had he's called me to something and I allowed what words of other people I sat back I wasn't good enough I wasn't good enough And one thing I learned the Bible tells me this it says Bible tells us that a man thinketh in his heart so is he And you see, the more you allow the words of other people or the hurt of a situation run your life, the bigger risk you have of becoming a fire starter yourself. I want to say that one more time. The more you allow the words of other people or the hurt of a situation run your life, the bigger risk you have at becoming a fire starter yourself. We become so consumed with the words that other people have spoke over our life. We're mad about it. We feel entitled to it. That it changes us. And we begin to speak. And we begin to be hateful. And we begin to speak all these nasty things about us. And oftentimes, again, we feel entitled. I have the right to feel this way. They said this about me. No, you don't. And it takes me to my second point. My words. Maybe you've said the wrong thing at the wrong time. I think all of us can raise our hand at that, right? We were like, okay, foot, insert, mouth, me, right? We've been there. And see, just like we read with the forest fire, it just takes one word, right? One word. One word. And one thing I've learned is a lot of us, man, we're not aware of the hurtful things that are coming out of our mouth. It's become almost like a part of who we are, and we're so unaware of the hateful, judgmental, critical person that we really are. 
And sometimes we, we gossip about everybody, but we think it's like it's just a quiet thing or we're just going to pray about it together. Um, but in, in, in truth, reality, like when this is, when this is happening, you're gonna, you hurt a lot of people. That best friend you had, well, like she's mad. Your husband that you thought was so like he's gone. And that fun-loving person that everybody wanted to be around, they no longer want to have anything to do with. You see, just like that park ranger, I think of her, and there were red flags burning. She was trained. She knew better than to light that match, but she allowed her emotions to get the best of her. How many of us in this room, we know better, but our emotions get the best of us. We find ourselves sitting in it, and then we begin to speak things. Listen, we have to pay attention to what it is that we're speaking. Are you speaking life or are you speaking death? And I think the biggest thing that irritates me and one that God really had to get me is we have to stop blaming people from our past for the words that are coming out of our mouth today. Matthew 15, 18 says this. It says, but the words you speak come from the heart. That's what defiles you. Matthew 12, 33, a tree is identified by its fruit. If a tree is good, its fruit will be good. If a tree is bad, its fruit will be bad. You brood of snakes, how could evil men like you speak what is good and right? For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. The words you speak determine what's in your heart. Your heart is the source of your speech. You can shout Jesus from the rooftop all you want to, but your true self will eventually be revealed if your heart isn't right. All the selfishness, the dishonesty, the insecurity, the envy, all these things produced from our heart will eventually shine through in our mouth. And I want you to understand something. When the Bible talks about our heart, it's not really talking about like the physical mass that's in your heart that's pumping the blood. You see, when the Bible's talking about our heart, it's talking about like our soul. And our soul is made up of three parts. Our, it's our, our mind, it's our will, it's our emotion, right? And our mind is, gives us the ability to think, okay? Our will involves our capacity to make our choices, and our emotions give us the ability to feel. And all of this comes together at an intersection where our heart is. So when our mind, our will, and our emotions are filled with nothing but negativity and judgment and critic, listen, it just comes right out of our mouth. I used to be very carefree with the words that were coming out of my mouth. I would say anything, and I learned over the years that people really didn't care about my opinion. (laughs) I wasn't something they were just craving to hear. Sometimes I didn't have all the facts. And truth be told, sometimes the issues, they weren't with other people. They were with me. I heard a saying a long time ago, and I really stick to it, that hurting people hurt people. And even though maybe you're hurting and maybe their words did something, it doesn't give you an excuse to keep hurting people. We've got to pay attention to what's coming out of our mouth. But I will tell you from experience, listen, That if you try to fix your mouth without changing your heart, you're really setting yourself up for failure. Because if you try to manage the symptom rather than the root, you're not going anywhere. And what I think gets me the most is when we use these words with the people we love the most. We're fun-loving wife, mom, daughter, friend, And then within a moment's notice, they are the ones that we're barking at and yelling and being angry and saying nasty, absolute hurtful things to them. And sometimes it's not even with our words, it's our tone. I love you. I love you. Our tone is just as nasty as our words coming out of our mouth. And it says, watch your tone. Listen, we've all started a fire or two probably with the words that have come out of our mouth. I know I have. And the Lord really had to get a hold of me And there's a good chance that we're going to mess up again. But the point is, is that we've got to understand, we've got to pay attention, and we've got to make, we've got to learn from the lessons being made. Proverbs 15, 4 says this, a soothing tongue, speaking words that build up and encourage is a tree of life. But a pervasive tongue, speaking words that overwhelm and depress, crush the spirit. 
We're supposed to be uplifting one another. We're supposed to be encouraging and edifying somewhere we've messed up and we have forgotten that, right? We're supposed to speak life. The third point I have is his words. You see, I'm able to truly speak the name of Jesus when I feel my heart up with his words. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, it says this, all scripture is God-breathed. It is useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may thoroughly be equipped for every good work. I don't know about you, but man, I want to focus on his words for my life. Not their words and definitely not mine. You see, the word of God has the ability to change my life, to encourage me, to give me hope. The word of God brings correction to my life when I need it. And Hebrews 4 tells me that the word of God, it's alive and it's active and it's sharper than any double-edged sword. And if there's anything that I have learned over what I have walked through is that although I love waking up in the morning, I have a special place, I get my devotion, I get my Bible, I have my coffee, I look out into the field, and I have my Jesus time. And as much as we all need that, our Bible is not our happy little feel-good place devotion book, but it is said it is a sword and it is a weapon. And I think sometimes we forget that we are to use this weapon and we are to speak and we are to begin to proclaim and speak the name of Jesus over areas of our life. Do you hear me? I've walked through a lot of different things, especially being a pastor's wife. But it was through these things that I remember, thankfully, that through my little quiet times, I was hiding his words in my heart. And when things would come my way, I would sit and I would begin to quote things like, Joshua, I will be strong and I will be courageous. I will not be afraid because I know that you are with me wherever I go. I will not have fear because you've not given me the spirit of fear, but you've given me power. You've given me love, and you have given me a sound mind in Jesus' name. I know I've said things like Psalms 23, that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. It's when we begin to speak his words, this is to me that mountains can be moved. Amen? I know some of you know a little bit of our story, but a couple of years ago, my husband walked through depression. It was terrible. And I don't know if any of you have ever walked through depression, if you, if you deal with depression now. This was not something that I, that I was familiar with. I, I was not used to this. And everything was great up until this point. And it, I mean, it, it, it was just like, almost felt like it was overnight. And I remember when we went through this, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to waste a whole lot of time on this story, but it was hard. <laughs> And the first six months of it, like I said, we're pretty transparent people, but the first six months, I remember, I did everything I can. I went into protect mode. I wanted to protect my kids. I wanted to protect the church. I wanted to protect my husband. So we kept everything in. But our home was awful. It was a battlefield. I remember we would fight. He was, I mean, it I, I, the things he was thinking, the things he was assuming, the things that he would, the things that he would accuse, it was awful. It was not my husband. It was not our marriage. And I felt terrible because, again, I'm trying to protect my kids. Our kids are not stupid, right? And we went through so many different things, and I was like, Lord, I, I can't do this. Lord, where are you? Why is this happening to me? Lord, we're pastors of a church. This should not be happening. Like, Lord, where are you? I can't. I can't. I can't. Please help us. Change my husband. Give him hope. Twice we had two different suicidal things, and I remember I walked out into the garage one day, and I had to get a gun out of his hand, he left one day, didn't, he was like, I love you, I'm sorry about all of this, tell my kids, and he left. Had no idea where he went, he was gone for hours, turned everything off, no locators were on, had no idea, and it was in that moment that I was like, I cannot do this by myself anymore, and I picked up a phone, and I started calling people, help me find my husband, this is what's happening, 
And there was a man in the church that went out and they found him parked on the railroad tracks in Republic. And Republic is, railroad tracks are all the time. And wouldn't you know, they didn't come that day. Hmm. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff that happens with people, but I don't understand why we feel the need to cover it up. Because it wasn't until I reached out that I felt like other people came in to hold my hands up. They found us help. We had people surrounding us. We had people praying over us. We had people speaking the name of Jesus over my, ha- over my family and over my house. And the biggest thing that changed me, I will never forget this, ever, and I will speak this a lot, but we had a rough day. I wish I could tell you that the moment, all you know, everything just changed overnight, but it was a process, and I remember one day we had gotten into an argument, and I was like, oh my goodness, God, I, I just, what are we, I just, how much more of this? And I got in my car, I had to go pick up my kids from my in-law's house, and I sat down in my car, tears are streaming down my face. I said, God, where are you? But something changed when I sat in that car that day. Something flipped in me, and I thought, you know what? I'm done. I am sick of this, and I can do this. And I changed the words that were coming out of my mouth, and I said, Satan, I am so tired of this. You have no authority in my house anymore. He is a child of God, and I am a daughter of the king, so get out. I take right now, and we are restoring joy and order and peace in my home, and I will see this through. I began to speak words of hope that I am not the head, I am not the tail, I am the head, I am above, and I am not beneath, and that he who began a good work in me, listen to me, he was going to see it to completion in Jesus' name. You see, I changed my tone. I had pleaded and pleaded and pleaded for so long. And don't get me wrong, pleading with Jesus is totally fine, right? Because he wants us to come to him and sit at his feet. But sometimes he's like, I gave you a Bible to use as a sword, and you need to begin to speak it to the situation and speak Jesus. Why don't we do that? Something changed in me that day. I was like, I can do this. I can do this, and I will do this. And I remember from that, di- that, that moment on, I would watch him, my husband, I would watch him, and it was like everything would be fine, and then it was like it would just come over him. And I'm like, oh, no, we're not. And I would grab his hands, and I would just start praying Jesus over him, and I would begin to, I'm like, devil, not right now. No, we're not. And I would, and he would fight me. Like, sometimes he'd be like, eh, we don't need to do this. You know what I mean? I'm like, no, we're praying. And I would watch his shoulders like, like, calm down a little. You know, it was like they would just drop, and we would begin to speak Jesus in our home. We began to speak Jesus over our kids and over every area of that house. And I am so happy to tell you that we have not, we have not messed with depression in our house for years. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I want you to know that there is power in speaking the name of Jesus. But you have to know his words because, man, there's power when we speak the word of God. I will tell you a little story from that. We Six months later, after all of that, we went to Silver Dollar City as a family, and I remember watching Chad, and he just was like this all day, and just like head drop, shoulders, were, and I was like, oh, no, we're not. We are not going there again. I remember coming up beside him, and he, I was like, today's a good day. The sun's out, and look at us. Our call of our kids are with us, and we're having a great time, and I'm just speaking all the things. And I'm like, come on, here we go. You know, I'm like, we're, we're not going here again. We're not doing this. We're, we're going to have a really good time, we're, you know. And he just was like this all day long. And it was a couple days later, he came to me, and he said, hey, he said, do you remember that day at Silver Dollar City? I said, yeah, I remember. He said, I totally forgot I took a Dramamine because I get really sick on those rides. I said, you cannot do that to a girl. (laughs) I said, you got to let me know next time because I thought it was all coming to an end again. (laughs) Tell your family when you take that stuff, man. (laughs) I'm coming to a close tonight. And as I, again, was speaking and thinking of this word, I speak Jesus. 
And crazy enough, Chad and I were on staff at a church um, early on when we got married, and we were on staff with Dustin Smith. And Dustin Smith is actually the author and the writer of this song, I Speak Jesus. And we were talking to Dustin about kind of the conference, and I was like, hey, I'm like, tell me about this song, you know, like when you wrote it. And he said, crazy, he was actually um, at a writer's convention and teaching people how to write songs. And he, it was about, they were about done, they only have like an hour left. It took them 45 minutes to write this song. And he sat in a room with another guy with four ladies who had never wrote a song before in their life. And he said each and every one of them started um, giving like things that their family members were going through. And they, they spoke names out. And they said every single one of these verses has a name attached to one of their family members that were there. And you know what I thought was crazy? I kind of was digging into this song a little bit. I love this song. We sing this song at our church. But man, there's a lot of controversy about this song. I don't know if you guys realize that. And I started reading through the reviews, and I'm like, seriously? Why do people feel the need to always share their opinion? Again, not everyone cares. And so I'm like, why? Everybody is just so hateful, you know? And they're like, "Um, why? We don't need to speak the, you know, like, what is this name it and claim it stuff? And we don't need to speak this. And there's several churches that have actually, it's not allowed to be sung in their church. And actually, the people who are commenting were worship pastors. (laughs) Like, I was like... Seriously. <laughs> and thankfully, there were other people that were kind of backing it up, and they were, like, like um, responding to it. And they're like, man, we think this is amazing because we speak the name of Jesus. We believe what the Word says that, you know what, when we begin to, to speak the name, that he is there and he's backing us up. Amen? I don't know about you, but I believe in speaking the name of Jesus. The worship team is going to come back, and I know that they've got songs, but... I told you I felt really heavy tonight with this, with this message. But I think where I felt really heavy was kind of the altars a little bit. And I'll be honest. He agreed. I'll be honest. <laughs> I'll be honest. Sometimes it's really hard to be transparent, right? Right? We've got our friends here. Those of you that are in leadership, sometimes we got to keep it all together. Can I just tell you no? It's time to just be vulnerable for a minute because we all go through junk. And I don't think it was by accident that I had to speak something like this the first night. Wasn't it a little heavier? It was a little heavier than, you know, lighthearted. But I think that there are some of you in this room that are struggling with their words. And I know sometimes it's kind of rough to have to, like, bring up the past. You're like, we left that. That's in the past. Or maybe it was at home before you left. I don't know. But I do believe that there are people in here that you are struggling with words that have been spoken over you. There are words that you've carried with you. There are words that you have maybe unintentionally formed an identity around. And tonight I just want to speak Jesus over you. And I want you to know that you are worth it. You are enough. You are loved. You are an overcomer. And Jesus has more for you. I believe there are people in this room that are dealing with family issues Maybe it's depression. Maybe it's you that is walking through the depression. Maybe you're the one that's walking next to someone who is going through depression. Or maybe you are someone in this room who is carrying a heavy burden because of one of your kids. My heart was heavy tonight, and I remember sat there And I looked at my mom, and I was like, man, front and center, like, wow. (laughs) Like, (laughs) it was right here. (laughs) But I remember sitting here, and I was, I'm like, God, this is, you just have to do whatever you want tonight. As uncomfortable as it may be, I just, God, I need you just to use me and do whatever it is that you want. 